welcome back to Uncharted X. This is Ben, and I hope you're all doing well. The last several months have been a very busy time for me, and for the researchers of the Vase Scan project, and I wanted to put out something of an update on their recent work, much of which I've had the privilege of documenting, and also to give a preview of what's coming in the future. The TLDR version is, lots more vases have been scanned and analyzed, and the results are going to blow your mind. I took a trip to Florida to visit the amazing collection of one of the owners and got to inspect them. My first time ever holding complete, incredible artifacts like these. A long-held ambition and, I have to say, quite a thrill. I also spent a couple of days in Illinois with Chris Dunn and the engineers and metrologists involved in the Vayscan project, Nick Sierra and Alex Dunn, observing them doing real hands-on metrology inspections of vases in a precision engineering lab. Not only are the results of these inspections utterly profound in their own right, they're massively impactful to the story of history as we know it. Not only do they confirm the results and subsequent precision manufacturing conclusions reached by the analysis of the initial granite vase, these results have answered some of the open questions that remained after that work. Is this first vase a unicorn, a one-off, singular example? No, it definitely is not. Several of the vases that have now been inspected rival and in some aspects even exceed the precision found on the initial artifact. Are these things modern fakes? Well, no. Based on the work now done, we can confidently state that they are not modern fakes. Several of the examples recently studied possess impeccable provenance going all the way back to the 1800s, the century during which many vases were dug up from the sands of Egypt. This claim of fake is a charge that's levied by some of the skeptics and critics of this work, if not outright disingenuously, perhaps in an attempt to not have their egos or worldviews shattered by incontrovertible hard data. While criticism of and questions about the vase scan work are certainly legitimate, even necessary for projects like this, after all, it's profoundly narrative shifting in its implications, it's very difficult to argue with the hard data of the results and the open source nature of the work. You can download the vase scan and repeat the analysis yourself, and several independent people have done exactly that. I do, however, suspect that this particular cry of fake that's been levied against the project might be somewhat disingenuous, because even a cursory examination of what's involved with such a claim will quickly reveal that it simply does not make any sense. Maybe it stems from a lack of understanding of the nature and requirements for such precision manufacturing, in granite no less. Or maybe it comes from a desperate wish for it simply not to be true that these are in fact ancient Egyptian, even pre-dynastic artifacts, thousands of years old. While the team is working on getting access to museum pieces, many with indisputable provenance, and there are pieces in the current target collection that trace back to the 1800s, even with the OG vase, the original granite vase, with a known history going back to the 1980s, or with those that are traceable back to the 1960s, as are some of those featured in this video, you have to ask, who was doing micro-machining in granite back in the 1960s, even the 1980s? Who was taking the time to design them with elegant, elaborate geometric forms? Forms that are based on indisputable, complex, and entirely intended mathematical relationships, evidently based on principles of geometry and universal constants like the golden proportion. And then who was executing said design in such a difficult and intractable medium as granite, with precision down to the single digit thousandths of an inch? Work that today would only be possible on the very best machines we have, with ultra-smooth and precise bearings, rods and ball screws, mounted in massively solid all-metal machines and digitally controlled by a computer. 
the cost of even attempting to make one of these would be very high, likely beyond any return you might gain from trying to pass it off as a fake to antiquities markets, a point Alex Dunn made well in my first video with him. So what then? Was this some sort of hugely expensive practical joke? For what? In the hopes that someone a half century or more down the road decides to scan and analyze them with technology that wasn't even imagined at the time? Yeah, good one. What do they call you? Uh, the, <coughs> the, the funny man. Tell me a funny joke. No? Not very funny. So today, in this video, we'll get into the details of everything I just mentioned, so stick around. I've very much been looking forward to making this one. And at the end, I'll tell you where you can get access to download scans of some of these incredible vases yourself. By way of background, if you're new to this topic, I'd very much recommend checking out my previous videos on the frankly astonishing results from the structured light scan and analysis of a pre-dynastic granite vase from ancient Egypt. Pre-dynastic meaning it's classified based on its form and where it was found in a pre-dynastic burial that it was made before the civilization known as dynastic Egypt ever started which is estimated to be around 3150 BC, over 5,000 years ago. The first video on this vase discusses the initial scan and analysis, and introduces the professional engineers and metrologists who are behind the project and who deserve all of the credit for this work, Alex Dunn and Nick Sierra, as well as the vase owner, Adam Young. In the second episode, I cover some additional analysis of parts of the vase, particularly the area of the vase body between the lug handles, and discuss the 3D model or STL file being made publicly available. This is also a good backgrounder if you're looking for more context on the overall subject of hardstone vessels and their place in the history books. I won't cover this topic again in this video, but it is a subject both important and relevant to this discussion. I gave something of a speed run through it in that video, but much more detail is provided in a separate dedicated video about the vases, and also in one that discusses where the majority of them, over 40,000, were found, in the tunnels and galleries dug into the bedrock deep beneath the Step Pyramid at Saqqara. The background on these hardstone vases is also explained in my presentation on the Tale of Two Industries, which is chapterized if you want to skip right to it, as well as in a shorter live on-stage recording from my talk at the Cosmic Summit conference. Links to all of these videos can be found in the description box below or in the video tab on my channel. The third video covering the initial granite vase dived into the remarkable analysis done by cryptographer Mark Quist on his site unsigned.io as a result of the open sourcing of the STL file. Mark's analysis, his revealing of the mathematics and design behind the vase, is truly profound, and I'd very much recommend reading his articles on the vase or checking out my report on it in that video. To date, all of my content on this topic has centered on this single artifact, but I'm very happy to say that since then, the team has been able to inspect, scan, and analyze several more examples. This is thanks primarily to a new friend of mine, an individual who, since the vase project was announced, has managed to acquire over a dozen of these ancient and very expensive artifacts, and has been generous enough to allow them to be analysed and inspected. So many, many thanks for his passion and commitment to finding the truth. It's very much appreciated. At this point in time, October of 2023, more than 10 ancient hardstone vases have been scanned using structured light scanning, a process that creates an accurate model of an object to a resolution of less than a thousandth of an inch. Some have even been scanned via CT X-ray, including the original vase, a process that has micron level resolution and reveals the details of the interior of the object. Where structured light scans create a point cloud with millions of points, CT X-ray generates point clouds with billions, and the scan files are gigabytes in size. Initial precision reports have been created based on the scans, and we've even had some initial geometric and mathematical analysis performed to investigate design methodology, or to see if there's any shared basis between these remarkable artifacts. 
I'll get into the details a little later in the video, but the results from this initial work so far are, let's say, very encouraging. Not only have scans been performed, in October of 2023, the vase owners and engineering team met in Danville, Illinois to do a hands-on metrology inspection on a number of vases, with me tagging along to document the day. Led by Chris Dunn, Alex Dunn and Nick Sierra, along with the vase owners as well as engineers and executive staff from Danville Metal Stamping, several vases were put through an array of inspection, looking at concentricity, roundness, continuity and wall thickness. Danville Metal Stamping is an ideal location for such testing. They primarily manufacture precision parts for gas turbine engines in the aerospace industry, and Chris Dunn, before his retirement, worked here for more than 20 years. I want to extend a special thank you to the CEO and Chairman of Danville Metal Stamping, Judd Peck, and his son Gardner, for allowing the team to use their facilities on a weekend, and for allowing me to film inside their inspection area. This type of metrology inspection, when you're measuring down into the single digit thousandths of an inch, relies on all of the components involved in the process, and that starts with the surface plate everything is set up on. Granite is often used for precision surface plates and tables, as it's a very thermally stable material, and it can be ground very flat. One of the control surfaces used in this test at Danville Metal Stamping was a huge slab of rose granite, calibrated to a flatness of less than a thousandth of an inch. Some of the higher grade tables or plates, A or AA rating, can get down to a tolerance of 5 microns, 5 millionths of a metre, roughly one-fifth of a thousandth of an inch. Let's spend a little bit of time to put these numbers into some context. The primary measurement tools used for these inspections were dial indicators, held securely in height stands. The indicators are numbered in the thousandth of an inch, and each line around the indicator is half a thou, or 0 0.0005 inches. The tips of the indicators are preloaded, meaning pressed down slightly, so that they can measure both positive and negative movement of the tip. So what do these numbers actually mean? Let's quickly talk about precision in the modern world and what's actually possible with our very best equipment. Also, feel free to get your metric versus bananas jokes out in the comments at this point. I'm very confident I'll see some, but we're going to be talking in mostly imperial measurements in this video. This work is happening in the United States. It's what the dials and tools use, not to mention the engineers, although they are also fully conversant in metric. There are 25 microns or millionths of a meter in a single thousandth of an inch. Don't at me, it's close enough to it for the purposes of this discussion. I know that technically 25 microns is 0.984252 thousandths. A single micron is about the size of a bacteria, so let's just say it's pretty damn small. In terms of a modern example, let's consider an engine. Components of engines are generally precision made from metal on computer-guided lathes, mills, CNC's, that sort of thing. Nothing is done purely by hand, or even guided by hand. Parts in the engine used for non-critical features, those that aren't concerned with clearance or the like, might be machined to a tolerance of 0.02 inches, or 20 thou. For more critical engine features, the common tolerance range might be in the 3 to 15 thousandths of an inch, depending on specifics. Our modern machinery working with high-grade metals or composites can certainly deliver this level of precision. There are also very specialized, very, very expensive machines that, when working with aerospace-grade materials, can deliver micron-level precision. Actually measuring this type of microscopic tolerances is a challenge all on its own. You generally need a machine that's 10 times more accurate than what you're measuring in order to know that what you're measuring is representative of the actual deviations and not introducing error due to its own accuracy limit. At the boundary of this science of measurement is NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. They have CMMs, or coordinate measuring machines, that are spec'd down to 0.2 of a micron, able to measure something that might have been made with a tolerance of 2 microns. 
But this really isn't anything that happens in a production environment. NIST uses this level of tolerance and measurement in order to define the standards that the rest of the world is comparing everything else to. Here's perhaps a more tangible example. You might have heard me or Alex mention before that a human hair is between two or three thousandths of an inch thick. Well, here's a practical demonstration of exactly that. We'll set this with about 15,000. So this is called preload. Mm -hmm. You want to put preload on an indicator to make sure that you get enough travel to accurately define what you're measuring. So this little section of the surface plate, as you can see, is perfectly flat. Right. So if I just that very right painstaking there, enough, right? <laughs> you see how pull out one of my hairs. I didn't know. He's, yeah. So there's one of my hairs. Oh my God. I set it here on the plate. <laughs> And I, and I hit it with the indicator. Yeah. Oh, boom. There yep. you go. You see about two thousandths of travel on the indicator just from yep. moving over hey, a single hair. Right there. So, yeah, that's cool. Here's another demonstration. In this case, Chris Dunn used his precision straight edge against the very flat plane of the granite surface plate to show the gap generated by one of my hairs. Again, probably two to three thousandths thick. You want the hair? Yeah, let's, let's get one of Ben's hairs. It'll be really easy. You can get a hair, sure. Why not? How old are you, Ben? Uh, 45. 45? Mm hmm. Yeah, so you probably still have a two and a half pound thick hair. Yeah. Pick there one. There we go. Yeah. Big That's one. what I'm Lay talking down. about. Lay, Lay down there. We were measuring it just a minute. You measured one yeah. of his, but they're a bit shorter than mine. Soon to be available for sale on UnchartedX.com. <laughs> <laughs> Genuine yeah. Moichendizing. Moichendizing! <laughs> Where the real money of the movie is made. <laughs> are you, oh, are you doing I'm a doing light the light thing? Alright. Yeah, yeah. Where is it? Right there. Uh, so, maybe I can get right down on the level here. Yes. Yeah, I do now, yeah. 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 So that's a two thousand. Oh, okay. Right. Right. Another gap. And then yep. you do it without the hair. And it's just yeah. The gain up dead level, right? Mm-hmm. So up against the surface. Just a uh, good little demonstration, yeah. One of the <coughs> issues pertaining to the same thing. You know? there, yeah, exactly. Yeah. When you when you come to the question of uh, precision, and uh, people will claim that, well, it's not that precise. I mean, you know, you go to the bottom of the box and you can see it's out. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. I get that. Yeah. Uh, but it, yeah, if it, I mean, that, it doesn't need to be. I guess, but, for whatever they were doing. But just to get that precision on the top surface is not like an accident, right? right. That's, what, that's the idea, yeah. As a short aside, it's worth mentioning that this is the very same precision straight edge that Chris Dunn took to the Serapium of Saqqara in the 1990s, and he used it to measure the flatness of the walls inside a couple of the boxes. As reported in his book, Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt, he could not discern any light shining from beneath the straight edge wherever it was placed on the inside walls of one of the boxes. An incredible achievement. That said, I am aware that not all parts of all of the walls of all the boxes have this characteristic. In my now many visits to the Serapium, I've had the chance to get in a number of the boxes. In some cases, the lower parts of some inside walls have visible variation, and some appear as yet unfinished, while others, at least to the eye, seem to have no deviation anywhere. We know that the boxes of the Serapium were being machined, polished, and finished down here, in location, as there are several examples of boxes in various stages of machining. Perhaps not all the boxes were complete when the site was originally abandoned, or perhaps this is simply an example of intended precision, the same concept outlined in the example of a modern engine, where some parts are made more precisely than others for some functional purpose. 
This is a common concept used in modern manufacturing. Some parts are, by necessity, made much more precisely than others, as they might have different functional purposes, while others might be purely aesthetic. I've seen some people online point to examples like these, as if it was some sort of revelation or gotcha, a debunking of the achievement represented by these boxes. A conclusion that I find somewhat confusing and quite illogical. Just because not all of the surfaces of all the boxes display remarkable levels of precision by no means invalidates the feats of machining in the areas that do. You still have to explain the most difficult aspects of any artifact, particularly if you think that they were somehow made by butt flap wearing dudes rubbing on them with sand and rocks. It blows my mind that these boxes have never been subjected to proper scans, as the technology certainly exists, it's harmless, and it could help us to define the measurements and geometry of the boxes and learn an awful lot about their construction. Since my Serapium series came out several years ago now, I've been back to the site many times, and I've learned a lot more about it. I am working on a new video on the Serapium, and we'll get into all of these topics in more detail in that one. The primary vase inspection work at Danville Metal Stamping took place on a black granite table, where a rotating table or rotab was set up. The vases were painstakingly centred on the rotab, freestanding on their own bottoms, or in some cases upside down on their tops, and contained in their position by magnets placed on the rotab. The fact that these vases can be centred on their own surfaces also speaks to the precise flatness of those surfaces, and the exact perpendicularity they hold relative to the vase centreline, yet another remarkable attribute of these artefacts. And what's the, and the surface here is what? Four tenths. Four tenths. Yeah. This one. Yeah. Four tenths. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> just lapping. It's silly. It's just lapped. It's just silly. Once centered, indicator dials are placed and preloaded against the vase in two or three positions on the vase body and one on the lug handles as continuity of the handles is an area of particular interest. Uh, based on the uh, on Adam's face, we know that they have a, a flat plane, and so we're using that as a, a datum. And then from that flat plane on this rotary table, when we measure different points along the length of it, the rotab is then rotated via the use of an electric drill powering the mechanical gear set. It's worth noting that the rotab itself has a runout or variation of around a thousandth of an inch. Yeah, but the other the other thing is is that this table runs out probably yeah. a thousand. So, you the, know. so the table. The tape, the tape. So this thing runs no, out no, about this a thousand. One, this table, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So if I put an indicator on the table, the table's flat. Yeah, we looked at that a minute ago. Right. Oh, here it runs out on the. Okay. They run out on Sneak the around. You're right. Which would actually be a good indicator of the uh, precision of the bearings. You know. Oh, come on, focus. And then we look at that. You got it? Yep. So that's about a foul at 10. Yeah. yeah that's so good. that's fairly close, right? So that's like 10 thousandths of the scale on the gauge? Uh, no. Actually, the, uh, the indicator's uh, resolution is uh, 5.0005. Okay, so half, a half, a half okay. a foul. Yeah. As the table rotates, the dials show the runout or variance of the stone surface in increments of half thousandths of an inch, giving an indication of concentricity, roundness, and continuity of the shape and surface. 
What you're seeing here is essentially the same results as the geometric analysis done on the 3D scans. But at least to someone like me with no experience in precision manufacturing, it's a more tangible demonstration of the precision of these artifacts versus the, let's say, slightly esoteric to the uninitiated CMM work that's done in software on 3D models. Also, the wall thickness of the vases were measured with dire dial thickness gauges at four equidistant points around the center of the vase, 0, 90, 180, and 270 degrees, at least in the vases where the calipers can fit. We can compare the results to show the runout or variability of wall thickness, which isn't a measurement we've seen before on the scans. And I can say that the results observed showed that the interiors of the vases were very carefully machined indeed. Let's now get into some of the individual vases and their results. Overall, we found that the rose granite pieces, in particular these three, including the original vase, showed the highest levels of precision. Perhaps this is a feature of this particular stone type. After all, rose granite is commonly used to create precision surface plates. Other vases in the collection, some made from diorite or those with large corundum inclusions, were still what I would call very precise, but not quite to the same level observed in the rose granite pieces. This has led the team to speculate that perhaps this is a feature of rose granite pieces that might not be present in other vases. But honestly, I think our sample size just isn't big enough yet to come to any conclusions on material differences. I do know of several examples, found in museums around the world, that are made from various types of hard stone, that seem like exceptional targets for metrological analysis. Some display incredible balance and symmetry, others have remarkably thin wall thickness. The team has been progressing with getting access to museum pieces and remain optimistic that this will happen, but it's a slow process. So, starting with the original granite vase, here you can see it set up and centered on the row tab. Again, each line on the dial indicators is half a thou, or 0 0.0005 inches. Remember that the tips are pre-loaded so that they can measure deviation both up and down. So you're looking for the overall sweep of the indicator needle rather than any absolute value on the dial face, although they are zeroed out in their starting positions. The third dial down from the top is positioned and zeroed against the lug handles, so it will only generate a reading when the tip sweeps across the lug handles as the vase rotates. So A is 0 0.005. You got 5 thou on down there? That's excellent. B? I didn't see any. Is it just my own <laughs> The lug handles are dead nuts. They are, yeah. Yeah, so you could probably, I did 45 times. Got it. You put perfect numbers on an inspection report, the customer gets a little, yeah. gets a little concerned. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's when the source inspection gets a little difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect place for it. Okay, sorry. A is five. B is five thousand. C? C was two thousand. Two thousand. Two. One and a half. You sure? Yeah. I watched it like a hawk. <laughs> As we know from previous scans, the precision of this vase is truly remarkable, with no discernible deviation across the lug handles relative to each other. If any, it's certainly within the thou or so runout that might have been coming from the row tab. Other figures being returned were around 5 thou, 2 human hairs, and even 1.5 thou, less than the width of a single hair. Let's not forget that the explanation for how these things were made is quite literally by banging and rubbing on them with rocks, sticks and sand. Alex also set up an indicator to measure the continuity of the vase body in between the lug handles. 
this area is of particular interest, as explained in my second video on this topic, as even assuming this was made on a lathe, and that's a mighty big assumption when we're talking about pre-dynastic or early dynastic Egypt with no use of the wheel, only sticks and stones, it would not be possible to carve this part of the vase with that lathe process. Another tooling process would need to be employed, meaning you lose positional calibration with a process change, and that would show up in the level of precision measured. This is certainly true for even modern machining methods that involve tool and process changes. As reported from the scans and my second video, and now confirmed from the physical inspection, no significant deviation in precision is found in the area of the vase body between the lug handles. I think at this point, we're a long way away from sticks and stones, but the results keep on coming when we get to wall thickness. So we're not taking actual wall thickness measurements, we're looking for variation in thickness. Okay, looking for yeah. variation. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think I'm, I don't know, I'm in an alternate universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Scrap. <laughs> scrap, scrap it. it. Yeah, yeah. Job out. Supplier <laughs> called, it's scrapped, and they need more money. The next artifact that we examined is one I nicknamed the spinner for obvious reasons. <laughs> yeah, the report on this one was cool. Like the the. It was what was it? Uh, golden ratio squared was the basis for the curvature on the bottom and there's three concentric or three it's the bottom of it's made up by three circles of the same radii but one of them is just offset where it sticks out a millimeter and that's what gives it just this one oh, little tiny yeah. basis yeah i mean it's fairly well balanced look at it's still going like it's incredibly well balanced on a tiny tip and able to spin on its axis for quite some time. This is because the bottom curvature of the vase is made up from three circles of the exact same radius offset to each other and one of them protrudes by a single millimeter to form the tiny base that the vase is balanced on. It's a remarkable finding one of many made by a new engineer, Stine, who has recently joined the research team. The geometric and mathematical analysis of this and other vases being done by this researcher is ongoing work at the moment, and a future video will cover what's been found here in detail. So far though, I can say that the findings are no less profound than those made by Mark Vist on the original vase and they draw some very interesting connections with design principles found on that artifact. A couple of points from the initial investigation are worth mentioning here in relation to the spinner vase. Measurements of the main features of the vase are taken from the scan, its height and the width in different areas, the top lip, the internal opening, the neck, the lug handles, the widest part of the body, etc. Also, the diameter and radius of circular features can be measured. Although these are only based off sections of circles that are fit to particular curved aspects of the vase. The base, the body, the lug handles and the curvatures that form the neck and lip. Based on these measurements, several ratios of significance have been discovered that are based on mathematical constants like pi and phi, the golden proportion. In particular, phi shows up all over the place with this artifact. For example, the ratio of the radii of the lip over the neck is equal to pi over phi squared with an error of around 0.59%, in real distances on the vase around 0.19 millimeters. 
the diameter at the lug handles over the radius of the opening equals pi times phi within 0.1%, around 0.1 millimeters or less on the actual vase. The outer curve diameter over the body radius equals phi squared with 0.28 margin of error. The diameter of the body curvature h over the radius of the neck f equals pi over phi within 0.01% or 0.006 millimeters on the vase. This part of the vase analysis has now been automated with a program designed to find significant ratios once the measurements of the main features have been input. Perhaps the most interesting revelation of this phase to come from the early analysis is the discovery of the extensive use of the very same radial traversal pattern that was discovered on the initial vase. If you're unfamiliar with the radial traversal pattern, I'd recommend checking out Mark's article on unsigned.io or my videos that cover it. It's a specific mathematical function that is used to generate a range of circles with different radii that share a fixed ratio with each other. It's defined as r, the radius of n, an integer, equaling the square root of 6 over 2 to the power of n. With this equation, scaling the integer n up or down can generate circles with radii that match this pattern. The main thing to understand here is that only circles with a very specific radius can fit this pattern. A simply random set of curves with different radii would not match the algorithm. So, when you find curvatures that fit the pattern, it's showing that the circles are mathematically related. Analysis of the initial granite vase showed that it was designed practically entirely by curves that fit this function, with radii as small as 1 mm up to larger circles with radii of 4 to 5 cm. The fact that the vase can then be represented by a series of mathematical equations also tells us that it was specifically designed this way. This simply cannot have happened by accident. Astonishingly, this same radial traversal pattern has also been found on the spinner vase, both in ratios and in subsequent analysis of the radii of its features. The radius of the top lip over the radius of the opening equals the square root of 6 over 2 to the power of 2 almost perfectly, with a margin of error of 0.09% in real terms less than 0.03 millimeters on the vase. Using this match, the radius of D, which is the opening of the vase, was used as the base integer, or R of 0, for the calculation of the radial traversal pattern on this vase. Once this value was used, the radii of most of the curvatures on the vase accurately matched the same radial traversal function. Astonishing, and a clear link between design principles on two very precisely made artifacts. Looking at this table, you can see how the measured circular features match the radial traversal pattern. In particular, curves E through N are very close, both in terms of percentage of error and in absolute values on the vase, many being less than 0.1 of a millimeter in deviation. The image that you're seeing now shows all of the circles that are derived or generated from the radial traversal pattern, with the start point R0 equaling the radius of the opening and those are overlaid on the scan of the vessel, and it's a remarkably accurate fit. You can think of these generated circles as being basically perfect, as they don't account for minor deviations, damage, or tolerance variations on the surface of the vase. And when they were compared against the measured main vessel features, its height and its width in different areas, even more precise ratios of significance were discovered. Take a look at this table and the margins of error and deviation distances of just how well they match the geometric and universal constants of pi and phi. This is yet another truly remarkable aspect of this artifact, and I think it's telling us a story of the design philosophy and elegant mathematical system that's behind it. Now, certainly not all of the features of this phase can be explained with this formula. This was also the case with the original vase, and the very few other dimensions that didn't match the radial traversal function were shown to possess significant ratios connected to pi, phi, or to the base measurement derived from the vase by Mark's analysis. 
Speaking of the base measurement on the original vase, I want to quickly cover that because I didn't touch on it in my previous video on the unsigned.io article. And having had it properly explained to me now and forcing my own dumbass to go do some of the math, I finally get it. And it's left me gobsmacked. It starts with pi. If you take the diameter of the top lip over the radius of the internal opening, the straight red line over the straight blue line on this image, you get pi within 0.1% or around 32 microns on the vase. In a similar fashion, the golden ratio, phi, also appears when you take the diameter of the vase neck over the radius of the internal opening. It's phi squared within 0.07%, 20 microns. We also see phi when we compare the diameter of the top lip to the radius of the foot of the vase. It's phi squared within 0.08%, 35 microns, and this comparison is taking place at the two points of the vase furthest from each other. Mark describes this next bit as something of a mathematical gift, and now that I fully understand it myself, I agree with him. Because the diameter of the top lip is already produced by pi, as we just showed, and we're using the diameter of the top lip to show phi, the golden ratio, in the radius of the foot, we have a double equivalency here. And we can express the radius of the foot differently, as follows. The radius of the internal opening times pi over phi squared. Where this gets really interesting is that we now have the connection between all four measurements, the diameter of the top lip, the diameter of the neck, the radius of the internal opening, and the radius of the foot. We can now extend the statement and put it all together in terms of Ri, the radius of the internal opening. This looks complex, but it's pretty fundamental. Just follow me here. The diameter of the outer lip equals the radius of the internal opening times pi and the diameter of the neck equals the radius of the internal opening times phi squared, and the radius of the foot equals the radius of the internal opening times pi over phi squared. If we assume Ri, the radius of the internal opening, equals 1, therefore the diameter of the outer lip equals pi, and the diameter of the neck equals phi squared, and the radius of the foot equals pi over phi squared. Therefore, with all these amazing and elegant ratios between significant measurements of the vase becoming clear, it's a fair assumption to make that Ri, the radius of the internal opening, equals 1. This seems to be the base unit of measure, the designer's unit of 1, the radius of the internal opening, that applies to the entire vase. And it's a very interesting number, around 18.739 millimetres. This just so happens to be the same length within 2 microns as the wavelength of a 16 gigahertz electromagnetic wave traveling in a vacuum. You get the same number by a simple division of the speed of light. The speed of light in a vacuum divided by 16 gigahertz equals 18.73 millimeters. Using this base unit of 1, and if you followed me on the math, you might have already noticed this, when you use it to look at the other dimensions of the vase, elegant, significant ratios are made clear. The lip diameter is pi base units. The neck diameter is phi squared base units. The foot radius is pi over phi squared base units. It's simply mind-blowing and very elegant, all encoded into the dimensions of this artifact wrought in stone thousands and thousands of years ago. Returning to the spinner vase, perhaps we will see similar results on this item, only time and more study will tell. It seems impossible at this point, much as with the first vase, to claim that all these mathematical relationships and significant ratios could exist by accident. Again, we're looking at an object that was very elegantly designed before being manufactured with remarkable precision. Speaking of precision, let's get back to the inspection of this vase. Once mounted and centered on the row tab, this granite vase displayed precision of roundness and continuity very similar to that of the first vase. Ready? All right.
Four thousand. Three and a half. Two. Two? Yeah, that one already moved. Yeah. <laughs> huh? That one already moved. Fucking hell, <laughs> man. What did you get, Nick? Three and a half. Oh, three and a half. <laughs> <laughs> You think that you, anybody who thinks that wasn't turned on a lathe, raise their hands. All right. Runouts on the body and lug handles were two thou, four thou, and three point five thousandths, respectively. Astonishing precision. We also examined the area of the vase body between the lug handles, showing a runout of around five thousandths of an inch. Two human hairs. The wall thickness of the vase was measured and compared at multiple points, showing a variability of two thousandths of an inch. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> it's it's like, zeroed it's, out. It's, it's, a, it's two thousand maybe. No, it's closer than that. It's like almost a oh, thousand. I'd say it's, uh, each, each line is one thousand. So. This vessel has been precisely machined, both inside and out, such that the thickness of the material varies only by the diameter of a single human hair. I really don't know how else to put it, or what words that might adequately describe what this means other than to again remind you that these are explained as having been created with very primitive methods, sticks and stones, and no use of the wheel. And it's an explanation that's getting more and more detached from the reality and accumulation of evidence that we have in front of us. Alex also inspected the thickness around the neck, and you can hear the wonder and incredulity from the engineers present when the runout of around a single thousandth of an inch is found. 0 0.230, get out of town. Zero point two seven nine. So, who was doing micro machining in 1968? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let alone... That's, that's one question to ask, right? And if that isn't enough for you, an examination of the neck diameter in two axes also zeroes out a set of precision calipers. <laughs> wow. Moving on to another vase, and if I had to pick a favourite amongst the current collection the team has been working with, mm, this would probably be it. Primarily because it's particularly thin-walled and delicate. Even though it's made from granite, it's a minor miracle that it's still in such good condition after millennia. The material thickness on this artefact ranges from 4 down to an astonishing 2 millimetres, less than a tenth of an inch. Flinders Petrie documented even thinner pieces, down to one fortieth of an inch, but this vase is remarkable in any case, particularly considering the difficulty of the medium, rose granite. It's thinnest around its centre, and as a result is translucent. Light shines through the stone, highlighting the quartz inclusions and other components in the matrix. Once again, when centered on the Rotab, we can observe the incredible precision that went into its manufacture. What do we got? 
Yeah, he was about 20 nine nine for nine thousand. Nine thousand on him? I don't know. D was tough because it came off and on so quick. Yeah, yeah. there was. Uh, so the way I'm kind of doing it is when it like, jumps, and okay. then it just kind of serves in collections. Yeah. So I was trying to try. So I had about three thousand D. Three thousand D. Four and a half. Four and a half on C. Oh, Let's check. We'll do And I guess if the handles are even offset just a little bit, then the reading is going to be. It's going to about 3,000 there. Oh, wow. There's no movement on C or D. It's like crazy. I mean, it's got to be 3 or Yeah. Yeah. 10, though. That's fine. 10. 10. Record it. Single digit thousandths of an inch run out on the vase body and around 10 on the vase lug handles, which are slightly offset on this vase and not exactly opposite to each other. We also tested the inside of the vase lip for continuity with a run out under 10 thousandths of an inch. The area of the vase body in between the lug handles tested out in line with the other datum points for this vase with a run out of around 8 to 10 thousandths of an inch in spots and the majority being 3 to 4 thousandths. Where you can tell the soft material and they came in and they cut in between and they didn't blend the yeah, better. Yeah. It's really obvious. And just probably a little surface so, imperfection where it yeah. spiked there, a piece Any, of quartz or something. Mm -hmm. Anytime you see it, you see it. Yeah, just mm -hmm. jump a little bit, it's just hitting some piece which, of material on it. Yeah. Which we haven't quite, I mean, I haven't talked about that enough, just the actual material itself, like the difficulty of this material versus something homogeneous. Yeah. Is, yeah. yeah, absolutely. As mentioned in the clip, and as you might have seen in some of the other gauge movements, in particular location, the gauge dial suddenly spikes a few thousands, three, four or five, very quickly before returning to what you might call a more normalized sweep range just as quickly. We discussed this during the inspections, and there are a couple possibilities, as it only seems to occur in very small spots in the material when the indicator tip runs over them. The first possibility is damage. Almost all of these vases have visible damage, some more than others, and I suppose that it's somewhat to be expected given their vast age. In fact, a few of these vases were unable to be centered on the Rotab due to damage, and one or two of them show signs of repair where they've been glued back together, perhaps after they were found broken. Another possibility is that it's due to the nature of granite itself, and a chunk of material, a quartz inclusion, for example, was ripped out in the machining process, forming a small divot, or it wasn't cut cleanly relative to the other softer material in the granite. It's worth reminding everyone just how difficult granite is as a choice for artifacts like these. It's not a homogeneous substance. It's made up of mica, silica, quartz, hornblende, and other material, all varying significantly in hardness and percentages. Relative to a more homogeneous material, like steel or even other forms of stone, creating precision curved surfaces and very thin walls from granite is a much more difficult proposition. In terms of wall thickness on this vase, the team took measurements in two areas. Firstly, around the top. It's like zero to micrometer. Give it a couple more goes. Right here. So with the micrometer zeroed, I can section each measurement off in a couple of places. So there's one thou and four tenths there. Dead nuts. Absolutely no deviation. One tenth of deviation, 90 millionths. One thou and seven tenths. And three tenths of deviation. <laughs> Ten times the thickness of the deviation the wall thickness of the way around here, reduce that to a single point. So, 
Yeah, have fun hitting that by hand. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the idea. Oh, I got goosebumps, yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. That's the top, based on the initial geometric analysis, is an almost perfect conical section with an angle of one third of a radian. Interestingly, the ratio of the height of this cone to the height of the vessel equals the golden proportion, phi. The top lip also happens to have been very consistently machined in terms of thickness. Likewise, measuring the wall thickness around the body of the vase revealed an interesting feature. There's actually a groove or a valley machined into the body of the vase on the interior, which gets down to its lowest point. You know, I'd like at this time to honor our ancestors. Yeah. I can't go to Egypt and not be blown away by what they come from. No, this one's insane. Yeah. It's insane. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'll just start logging these into Excel today. See? Yeah. Well, 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 impossible. Yeah. Well, not impossible, obviously. <laughs> Expensive. So, at this point, I think you can see the trend for precision and geometric design of these vases. On the day, the team also inspected a few more vases, including this black granite, somewhat unique beehive vase, and this red granite lotus vase. Although the beehive vase isn't consistently curved like the other examples, it did prove to be quite precise, with runouts in the single digit thousandths of an inch when measured around its body at various heights. Some speculation was made as to whether this vase was actually intended to have this shape, or if it was perhaps unfinished in which case further inspection might provide some clues as to its manufacture. The red granite lotus vase was an order of magnitude less precise than the other vases, with runouts in the 60 to 80 thousandths of an inch range. This leads me to a point that I'm not sure I've made in the vase series so far, that not all hardstone vases are the same, and certainly not all of them will show the level of precision that we've seen on the initial examples you've seen in this video. I've never claimed that they were, and certainly there are lots of examples that are obviously not precision made, and likely were made by dynastic Egyptians using the primitive handheld grinding methods shown by scenes on the walls found in places like Saqqara. The problem here occurs when this primitive methodology is just blanketed over everything that's classified as coming from this period, a topic I get into in my Tale of Two Industries lecture. I've also seen some requests for handmade ancient artifacts to be measured or scanned. While I certainly think that this is worth doing, you really don't need to scan these sorts of artifacts to see just how not precise they are. I often point to the industry of alabaster vessel manufacturing that emerged after the Third Dynasty, the one that I think that is represented by the famous scene on the wall found at Saqqara. And by simply using your eyes, you can observe that they're not precision-made artifacts. They're out of round, they're not symmetrical, not balanced, and are certainly the product of relatively primitive handmade processes using flint or other hard stones. Alabaster, which these vases are made from, also known as white calcite, is far, far softer and easier to work than granite. And what I think we're looking at here is a process that was possibly developed by Imhotep, the architect and polymath of Pharaoh Djosa, likely in an attempt to imitate or replicate the incredible hardstone vases that we know existed for thousands of years prior to his time. During the day of inspections at Danville Metal Stamping, the CEO of the company, Judd Peck, after watching in amazement at the results that we were seeing, went to his home to get a couple of modern marble vases for comparison. This particular vase was made probably around the early 2000s, from marble, on a precision computer-guided lathe, and it's exquisitely polished and very smooth. A beautiful piece of artwork under any circumstances. Marble is similar to alabaster in hardness, far softer than granite, and a very consistent, homogeneous stone, making it ideal for sculpture and artwork. 
Measuring the outside surface of this vase yielded a runout of around five thousandths of an inch, very respectable, and along the lines of what you'd expect to see from a marble piece that was manufactured in a modern computer-controlled lathe. Note also that there are no lug handles here to contend with. This would have been made without having to reset the piece for a tooling or process change. Where it differed vastly from the other ancient vases was the inside, which, on the marble vase, was only very roughly carved out. Obviously the important part here was the external aesthetics, as no effort was made to thin down or machine the internal surface. Let's briefly return to the topic of provenance of the vases. As I mentioned in the introduction, several in the currently available collection have impeccable provenance going back to the 1800s and were known to exist in many museum collections, and many of them are also classified as being pre-dynastic. The pre-dynastic period itself is quite a wide range. It might be from several hundred years before 3150 BC, which is when the dynastic civilization started, or it might be 10,000 or more years before this. Dates for pre-dynastic burials from this period come sometimes from carbon dating, sometimes from other indicators. From what I can tell, most of the images and even recreations of pre-dynastic burials all seem quite similar. A primitive shallow grave with a skeleton or skeletons in the fetal position, and often accompanied by primitive hand-formed pottery, bead and bone ornaments and tools, and occasionally, of course, hard stone vases. This is true for burials of the Nadak culture, a precursor culture close to the time of the early dynastic period, and it's also true for far older burials like that of Toshka that I've mentioned before, dated to 14,000 years ago. While Toshka might be an outlier in terms of dating, it's certainly not the only one that stretches far back into time. In fact, one of the vases in the current collection also comes from very deep antiquity and has impeccable provenance. So this one was brought out by the Czechoslovakian ambassador to Egypt in the late 1800s and provenance is indisputable, regarded as pre-dynastic, found in a pre-dynastic burial where, you know, the carbon dating results in something that's maybe like 9,000 BC. Wow. Not exactly what we found. It's also relevant to point out that while precision stone vessels are found in pre-dynastic burials, there is literally zero evidence for any other form of advanced stonework happening in those periods. It's one of the main reasons I still think the best explanation for them is inheritance, and that they're in fact out-of-place artifacts, even in pre-dynastic times. And by the time they got into the hands of Egyptian pharaohs, they had likely been taken from older burials or inherited several times over. This is even the official explanation for many of the artifacts found beneath the Step Pyramid. It's acknowledged that Djoser did not have them all made and that they must have been inherited heirlooms. This strange paradox of advanced stone vessels being found long before other forms of stonework emerged is commented on and acknowledged by museums, archaeologists and antiquities dealers, as is the practice of pottery vessels being created in order to imitate the stone artifacts. In terms of the vases examined today, the two other precision-made rose granite vessels are classified as pre-dynastic, like the original vase, and have established provenance going back to the 1960s, when they were acquired and then held in the personal collection of antiquities dealer Fayez Baccarat, the fifth generation owner of a globally very well-known establishment in Israel. Although we've only covered the physical inspection of a couple of additional vases in this video, more than 10 examples have been scanned with structured light and CT X-ray scanning at this point. Several more vases have yet to be scanned as they've only very recently been acquired, but this will be happening soon. Interestingly, one of the recently acquired vases just happens to be the very same one that a certain skeptic of the vase scan project pointed out as a quote, real vase a granodiorite shouldered vessel attributed to the early dynastic period. I'm very much looking forward to seeing the results from this scan, as I'm sure so are many other people. There have been precision reports completed on these scanned vases based on the 3D models. 
I haven't really mentioned these reports in this video, firstly because it would take way too damn long, but also because these reports used a different methodology than that used by Alex and Nick on the first vase. Rather than creating a coordinate system based on vase features, tangent curves were drawn between points in order to generate a quote perfect surface, something that the actual surface of the vase could be measured against. While this method undeniably shows some remarkable results on many of the vases, single digit thousandths of an inch and even zero or perfect results in places, and it allows for both 2D and 3D comparisons and measurements, the team would rather adhere to a single procedure for vase analysis. This analysis work is happening as I'm making this video and it will be covered on this channel when it's ready. At the end of the day, the physical inspections are a much more tangible example of precision and they essentially reflect the data that we're likely to see in any analysis of 3D models. Likewise, the mathematical and geometric analysis work is also ongoing and you can expect me to cover the results once they're ready. So there's lots happening with the VaseScan project at the moment and the team has plans to continue to grow the sample size and perform analysis on vases already scanned. Progress is definitely being made in getting access to museum pieces, but all of these things will proceed at their own pace. It's certainly an exciting time as we're learning more and more about these remarkable ancient artifacts and slowly uncovering the mystery of their creation. Also, many thanks again to Vase Onam for agreeing to share his vase scans with me and with everyone. So if you'd like to download the STLs for several more of these vases, including the remarkable examples shown in this video, you can find them on the vase scan site on my website, unchartedx.com. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Please do let me know what you think about these remarkable artifacts down below in the comments and definitely let me know if you find any interesting aspects of them in the scans. Thanks for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.